Today, moving forward, we have the amazing privilege to have Dr. Mark Gorvet with us. Mark, Dr. Mark, if you want to come up, please. Dr. Mark will be sharing with us today. We are so honored to have Dr. Mark with us today. Dr. Mark is a pastor of pastors in central Indiana. There's about over 100 churches affiliated with just Waterline Church in central Indiana, and Dr. Mark is a pastor to the pastors of those churches. Um, so he leads them, guides them, supports them, helps them, and he also is an educator. He's been an educator for a number of years, educating in multiple different uh, avenues and different studies. So let's welcome Dr. Mark Gravett with us this morning. Thanks, Seth. <laughs> Man, I feel really old when he puts it that way. Um, actually, I wasn't much of an educator. I was the college president. I didn't only taught one class, so I'm uh, not a real educator. It's great to be with you. Uh, I think, did Seth just graduate from high school? I mean, he just looks so young. It's crazy. All right. It's great to be here. And Pastor John and his family are doing well. I've been following along, stalking them on Facebook. Sounds like Florida's a blast. I, my, one of my favorite pictures was their kids wiped out after that first day asleep. And, uh, you know, the little glasses were all cockways this way. And it was just kind of fun to see they're having a great time. Glad that you're here this morning. Hope you get some summer vacation, too. Uh, but this is a great place to be. And so when you're not out of town, don't miss it. There's some great speakers lined up. Uh, I'm looking forward to connecting with you today. So I want to invite you to turn, if you have your Bibles, to Matthew chapter 9. If you don't have your Bibles, you can track along. I think we'll put the verses up on the Scripture. And here's just the, the uh, kind of statement. It's harvest time in Indiana. It's harvest time in Indiana. Like, I don't know where this guy's from. He talks funny because I'm actually from Canada, out in a boat. Gives it away uh, when I say that. But uh, you're like, dude, this is not harvest time. It's planting. We just kind of got through that barely. The fields have been wet. Uh, this is not harvest time. But I think if you read these verses, you know what I'm talking about. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Can we just pause for prayer again? Father, thank you for this truth. And we don't necessarily need another sermon, but we sure would love to hear from you. So would you take uh, these lips of clay and Father, would you make these words that are simply at the moment ink on a page, bring them to life by your Holy Spirit. And speak to us today, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's harvest time. Well, you know pretty quickly from this passage of Scripture that Jesus is not talking about coin, corn or soybeans. Uh, he's talking about a whole different kind of harvest. Now, every harvest I've ever been part of has three things that are in common. And I don't know, maybe somebody else here has ever worked in a harvest. Like, did you, anybody have a garden last summer? We'll count that, okay? Uh, harvesting for me, one of my early experiences of harvesting was in upper northern Maine. Uh, my dad was up there, and uh, when I was looking to get a car, I'm 16 years old, I didn't get the keys handed to me. That would have been fun. Didn't happen that way. Uh, my dad said, you want a car? Great. Let me know how that goes for you. So I'm trying to think, how am I going to pay for a car? I lived in Prescott, Maine. It's not a very big town. Uh, there weren't a lot of places to work, but they did this. In fact, it was such an all hands on deck kind of experience. In Prescott, Maine, they shut down the public school. We started earlier in August and then they shut school down for two, sometimes three weeks so that all of the students could get out and go to work in the harvest. So man, I jumped into that. I want to be part of that. And so off I went. Now this is where I learned my executive decision making skills because in northern Maine they grow two things really well. They grow potatoes and they grow rocks. So the harvester goes to the field, it brings up the potatoes, they come rolling along this conveyor belt, and you have to make an executive decision. Is that a rock or a potato, right? Very, oh, I tell you, at the end of the day, my brain was just so tired, all those decisions, but we, we pulled it off for about three weeks. We worked in the harvest, sorting out, throwing off the rocks, throwing, letting the potatoes go into the truck, and at the end of the week, they, at the end of this harvest, they gave me this money. I was a happy camper because I went and paid cash for my very first car. Does anybody remember your first car? Okay, if you don't, uh, talk to me, because almost everybody I've ever met, maybe it's not a good memory, <laughs> but they do remember their first car. For me, it was a 1967 Chevy Bel Air six-cylinder. It was pukey blue, and uh, it, it had bad shocks. The shocks were so bad in the back of my car, and I didn't know because I'd never had a car, right? So I would put my sisters in the back seat. They're both younger. I would hit a bump, 
And for the next half miles, they were experiencing six flags over Georgia. I mean, it was just kind of, oh, they, that was great. It was wonderful. That was, I, that's when I discovered that there's value in the harvest. Now, I, I worked with potatoes up there. I had friends when I was in seminary in Mississippi. They harvested cotton. When I pastored in North Dakota, anybody been to North Dakota on purpose? Because you don't get there on accident, right? You, you actually have to plan to go. Uh, I, when I was there, they were, I had farmers in the, in the church who were harvesting 3,000, 4,000 acres of wheat. I mean, they, they took the harvest pretty seriously. And then last summer, my wife and I moved to Indiana. You guys are serious about harvesting in Indiana. I mean, I couldn't believe it. that that corn started to grow and grow and grow and grow. I mean, I, I work in this building and I drive up Olio Road and cut across 156 over to where we live. And, and it got to be so high, you just couldn't see anything. You're just a little afraid those children were going to come running out of the corn stalks or something. But it, it just was this tall stuff. And then I go by one day and it's all gone. I mean, they, they harvested it. It's just out of there. It's gone. And I discovered that in Indiana, in a given year, more than 30 billion dollars worth of corn is harvested 30 billion that's a lot of value in the harvest but there's nothing more valuable to harvest than people there's nothing that matters more to God than people when Jesus saw the crowds he said he was moved with compassion his heart was tugged it was stretched it was broken for people who needed help they were messed up they were broken. It says they were harassed and helpless like sheep just kind of wandering around on a hillside without a shepherd, getting in all kinds of trouble, all kinds of mess, all kinds of brokenness. Jesus' heart was moved for them. I love what you say here at Waterline. If you haven't picked one of those up yet, pick a card up there because it says this, you have always been loved. Now, if you've been coming for a few weeks, you know this, but take one of these with you this week. There may be somebody you encounter. If you're going to leave it with a tip, make sure your tip is really big, okay? Don't do this to a waitress, but if it's a really big tip, you can leave this there. Maybe you give it to a coworker. Maybe there's a neighbor. There's somebody that you connect with. You've always been loved. See, that's, that's the mission. The very first thing of the harvest is this idea that every person has value to God. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, the very best that heaven had. Because God's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. There's value. There's value in the harvest. But I also know this about a harvest. It, it doesn't harvest itself. Even if you had tomatoes in your garden, I've never heard anybody say, you know, that tomato jumped off the vine, it rolled up to my porch, came through the screen door, jumped up in the sink, washed itself off, sliced itself and laid itself on my sandwich. Doesn't happen that way. It takes work. And you, you know, I'm laughing about those decisions, potatoes, rocks, potatoes, rocks. I remember working in a blueberry harvest one time. We were down literally on our hands and knees for a couple of weeks, just scraping through these low bush berries. Oh, I can hardly stay down there that long. We did it for days. There was work. There was sweat. There was an engagement. There's a lot to be done. I was reading about the corn harvest in Indiana that back in the 1920s, it would take a farmer nine hours to harvest 100 bushels of corn. Nine hours. That's a lot of work. You know how long it takes to harvest 100 bushels of corn today in Indiana? Guesses? Less than seven minutes. Less than seven minutes. 100 bushels. That work has changed over the time. And I work, as, as Pastor Seth said, I work with a lot of churches. And there's some churches that are still doing what they did 100 years ago. There's other churches like Waterline who have discovered we're going to do whatever it takes to reach people. We're going to connect with people, even if it means having a crazy party like the Saxony 500 or going to the water park and seeing if you can drown Pastor Travis. I mean, whatever it takes, we're going to do things that connect with people today to catch their attention, to catch their heart, to let them know that we're here. There's work, and there's plenty of work to be done around here. I came early this morning, but I was not the earliest one. There were people who have been here an hour or so before me. They take an office building and transform it into this welcoming space, whether it's at the front desk or the guys that come in here and set up all the sound equipment or Claire and her team that make the children's spaces so engaging. There's, there's plenty of work to do. And I tell you, if you ever feel like I'm not needed, nobody cares about me, can I tell you, get involved. Get on a team and they will notice, they will care that you're there. There's lots of work to be done in the building. There's lots of work to be done on the team, whether it's in a small group or working with next generation, working with children, working with satellite. There's plenty to do. But it takes all hands on deck, and it's not just in the building. Can I tell you the most important work the church ever does is outside of the building. That's the most important work we do. I'll never forget. 
we had a, a friend day. The last church I pastored was a church called New Hope. And we had a friend day. Not very creative, but it was like, bring a friend. So uh, some of our high school students, three girls, they thought, who could we bring? Who was it that we know in our circle of influence that we could connect with? And they thought about their Spanish teacher, Charlene Nimick. Charlene, it was obvious from some stories she told or just some things that were going on that she really wasn't connected to God and she wasn't connected to a church and they got concerned about her. These high school students did. So they began to pray for her and they decided that they're going to invite her. And so one after another, not the same day, but they kind of spaced it out. They went up to her and said, Charlene, would you come, Miss, Miss Nimick, I'm sure they said Miss Nimick, would you come to church with me? I'd love to have you as my guest for friend day. She's like, well, I'll think about it. So the second girl comes up, Miss Nimick, would you come to my church as my guest for friend day? And now she's thinking there's a conspiracy because the third one, she's like, okay, I get it. If there's a church that teenagers like, I got to check that out. She hadn't been in church in over 20 years. She was raised in a nominal Catholic family, Christmas and Easter. She'd had a few experiences as a kid, but nothing really connected for her. And here she was going to go through life, early 30s, and just never made the connection. And these three high school teenagers invited her. So she came. I'll, I'll never forget. We had a center aisle. She was about six rows back on the right-hand side. And as I shared the gospel that morning, I could see she was very attentive. She was taking it all in. She came back the next Sunday and the next Sunday. It was about the fourth, maybe the fifth Sunday. So we, at the end of the service, just said, hey, if you've never trusted Christ with your life, if you've never taken a step of faith to say, God, forgive me my sins. I'm all in. I want you to love me and to lead my life. Would you just raise your hand for prayer? And I saw tears begin to trickle down Charlene's face and she raised her hand and we prayed that morning and people around connected her. They got her involved in a small group. They began to love on her and it was just amazing to watch her flourish, to watch her blossom and grow. Well, Charlene experienced the grace of God and, and wanted to do something about it. So she's at the teacher's lounge at school and she begins to tell her story, what she's discovered in this church, what she's discovered in her faith and relationship with God, what she's discovering in her small group. And the other Spanish teacher, Leanne, Besides, she will accept Charlene's invitation and goes to her small group first. You know, it's okay to go to your small group first before you ever start going to church. That's what Leanne did. She didn't know the rules. So she went there first, and they began to love on her and care for her and pray for her and listen to her story, and she began to share about some real pain. It wasn't long before she prayed to receive Christ, and as she shared her story, you began to hear about her family, and the situation at home wasn't good. Craig, her husband, had been in the military, came home with some, after some bad experiences, was a construction job site and fell a couple of stories and was paralyzed from his waist down. And he was mad. He was angry at life. He was angry at God. He was self-medicating with alcohol and marijuana and things were not good at their home. As Leanne began to share some of her story, people said, what can we do? We'll pray, but what else can we do? See, harvesting takes work. <laughs> There's work in the harvest. And, they, and she said, well, I don't know. Our, our, we've got a a ramp for Craig's wheelchair, and, and the ramp's gonna, it's not as stable as it needs to be. And we've got a, a light fixture, too, that there's some issues with. I don't know what's going on, or the switch, or something. One of the guys said, I swing a hammer. He said, we can come over, we'll work on the, on the ramp. And, and Ernie Crocker, big old Ernie Crocker, I can still see him. Ernie said, I'll take care of the lamp. We can fix that light fixture. He was an electrician. Now, neither one of these guys are worship leader, singer types, or like Zach up here doing his thing. They couldn't do that. They would never preach a sermon but they're like, we can do something. We can be involved. So on a Saturday morning, they went over with their wives and went over to help. One guy worked on the outside, and Ernie was inside working on the fixtures. And as he was talking to Craig, who's quite curious at this point, who are these people? What's the agenda? Why are they here to help me? They don't even know me. What's up with that? Ernie began to ask him about his life and, and said, hey, did I notice you've got a motorcycle in the garage? Well, it's not a normal motorcycle, you know, right? He's paralyzed from waist down, but he had a trike. Big wheels in the back, all the controls, braking and accelerate, everything on the handles. And so Craig said, yeah, I love to ride. It's one of the few things I get to do that I really enjoy. And Ernie said, I ride motorcycle too. I don't know if you ever thought about motorcycle riding as a ministry, but Ernie's like, whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. And so they began to ride together, not every Saturday, but Saturday now, another Saturday. And over time, as they stop, they have conversations. Ernie begins to share about the difference that Jesus had made in his life. And there came a day when Craig prayed to receive Jesus as Lord. I'll never forget the privilege of being there with Ernie as we lifted Craig out of his wheelchair and down into the water. We had to rent a swimming pool at a hotel for our baptisms. We didn't have a baptistry in the building there, so we had to rent that. And I'll never forget baptizing Craig and seeing the joy in his wife's face and seeing his kids, seeing their family united by the grace and the love of God. 
see this work in the harvest. And whether you're the preacher or the children's worker or sound tech or a person who says, hey, I'm going to help my neighbor or I'm going to reach out to my coworker. Every one of us has people in our lives that we can make a difference for. You know, there's about eight to 15 people in your life where you're a significant voice for them. For example, if you said, hey, I think you ought to buy this kind of car instead of that kind of car, they would really stop and think about it. You have influence. You have credibility with them. If you said, hey, you ought to try out this restaurant. This was, this was a great experience. You really enjoyed it. They'd stop and think about it. If you said, hey, my kids love this school. You really ought to think about your kids being in that school district. They would stop and think about it. You have influence with about eight to 15 people. And you know that's not an accident. God has given you that influence not to try to sell them a car or a school district. God has given you that influence, that opportunity. That is your mission field. To pray for them, to love them, to engage with them. What, what if the only reason that you're still alive today is that there are people in your circle of influence who need Jesus and you may be the only person who can tell them? What if that's the only reason you're still alive? You've been given a purpose. Your life work, this idea of leadership in leading into other people's lives what if that's why you're here see every harvest has value and every harvest requires work and every harvest has this sense of urgency you know harvests don't get more ripe after a point harvests go from ripe to rotten <laughs> you know they, they go from ripe to rotten if you if you don't get the harvest when it's ripe when you miss that window of opportunity it's all over i even last summer i was You'd hear these weather forecasts and the farmers were checking about rain and will there be an early frost and they're really nervous. Why? Because they know there's just this window of opportunity that if you don't seize it, you could lose everything. You could lose everything. You don't know Bob Powers, but he means a lot to some people because Bob Powers was a railroad worker. You said, big deal. A railroad worker? Yeah, he worked on a railroad. He worked on a railroad in Canada. In that railroad in Canada, they would go all across those north woods, and as they're traveling, Bob would see the moose crossing tracks. Now, I haven't seen the moose crossing tracks in Noblesville yet, but uh, up in Canada, big. You imagine, a, imagine a horse with horns. I mean, this, these are big animals. And so Bob would see these moose crossing, and he'd know where the trophy moose was, so when hunting season would come, he'd go off, and he'd almost every year come home with a trophy moose, and everybody in the neighborhood knew about it. One day his churches said, we're going to have a special special service, a special meeting time, and let's, let's invite our neighbors and friends who don't know Jesus to come, and let's see what we can do to connect them with the love of God. Bob was thinking, who do I know? Who do I know? And across the street from Bob was a house. In that house, there was a family, and it was obvious from some things going on that they really weren't that plugged into faith, okay? Uh, he just noticed. He wasn't judging, he just noticed. And so Bob says, I I'm going to go across and see if maybe they would go with me. So he Knocks on the door. The father says, no, I, I don't think so. The mother says, I, I'm too busy. The oldest teenage son says, no, and I think he was thinking, I'm too cool. And the youngest teenage son says, uh, no, if my older brother's not going to do it, I'm not going to do it because I want to be cool like he is. But the middle son, about 16 or 17 years old, and he said, man, to himself, Bob's a big game hunter. If I go to church with Bob, maybe he'll take me Hunting. Now, that's not the greatest motivation. Can I tell you, I've heard of people going to church to meet girls. So hey, there's all kinds of crazy motivations. People go to church. But that's why he went. He wanted to find out maybe he could go moose hunting. So Bob takes him to church with him. He goes there and hears the songs and hears the message. It doesn't really grab him. He's listening, though, to Bob. And on the way home, they're telling some stories. And at some point, Bob says, hey, you want to come over to the house? We can talk some more. And the young guy says, sure. And Bob says, I'll make some hot chocolate. You read this little booklet. So Bob gives him a booklet and goes to the kitchen and starts praying. And he's making the hot chocolate and he's waiting. And out there in the other room, the young man begins to read this little booklet. The booklet simply says, you must be born again. In simple little words and simple pages, it said this, everybody sinned. Sin separates us from God. Without forgiveness, our sin will lead us to eternal death, separated from God forever. But Jesus Christ, God's Son, came in our place, died on the cross, if we would confess our sins, if we would trust Him as the only hope of our salvation, He could come into our heart, forgive those sins, give us a new life with peace and joy, a relationship restored with God, life here and life for eternity with God. The young man read the booklet once, read it twice, read it three times. He said that like the fourth or fifth time, it was like someone turned on some floodlights and 
all of a sudden he got it. Now we'd understand that's the Holy Spirit. See, it's the Holy Spirit that even lets you know you need God. We wouldn't know we needed God if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that teaches us what it means to need and long for God. And in that moment of clarity, he realized he needed forgiveness. He needed salvation. When Bob came back out with the hot chocolate, he said, well, what do you think? And the young man said, I think I need to pray this prayer. And they prayed the prayer together, simple sinner's prayer. Lord, I admit I've sinned. I need your forgiveness. I believe that Jesus Christ died for me and I place my trust, my confidence in what Jesus did for him. Not in my good works, but in what Jesus did for me. I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me. Live in me. Lead me. He prayed that prayer and it changed everything. See, this guy was in trouble. He was a teenager, but he'd already made some bad decisions. He was involved in substance abuse. He was involved in some crazy activities. In fact, he'd started stealing from his employer. With his heart changed now by the grace of God, he began to make some better decisions. He'd almost flunked out of school. He began to apply himself, get back into high school. Finally, there came a day he even went to his employer and said, I've got to tell you the truth. I've been stealing from you. He'd sold the stuff and spent the money. He didn't have anything. He just told his story. The employer, the astute businessman, not a, not a Christ follower, he said, I don't understand exactly what's happened, but it's obvious that something's different. He said, if you'll keep walking the way you're going, he said, you won't have to worry about this. It wasn't long before the pastor said to this young man, he said, uh, have you ever thought about maybe being a minister? <laughs> no. <laughs> he said, think about it, pray about it. And he did. Before long, he went off to a Christian college studying for ministry. While he was there, he met a young lady. When they graduated, they got married, and they started pastoring a church together. And a year later, I was born. See, Bob Powers walked across the street and knocked on the door of my father's house. I'm glad he had a sense of urgency about it because my dad was making some bad choices. He would say by his own admission, standing here today, I don't know where my life would have ended up. You, you know, we sometimes kind of live like we're always going to have tomorrow. There will always be another chance. But Jesus said, work while it's still day because the night comes when man can't work anymore and you don't know when the night comes. Pastor Travis shared about a young 41-year-old mother who died this week of cancer. She knew Jesus. There's no question about it. She knows where she'll spend eternity. But there were people who went bicycle riding last week in Kalamazoo together. They stopped in the park. You'd think, can't be any more relaxed and chilled out than that. Kalamazoo, Michigan, after a bike ride and a car comes through that parking lot, that park, and kills them instantly. We don't know. And for those of us who know Jesus Christ, we've got great confidence. We know where we'll spend eternity. But there are people that God has placed in your life in that circle of 8 to 15 that if we don't reach them, who will? If you don't tell that neighbor who will, if you don't tell your friend, if you don't share your hope with that coworker, who will? Every harvest has value. $32 billion in corn in Indiana, but Jesus died for you. He died for them. Nothing matters more to God than people. Every harvest takes work. There's something to do here in the church, and certainly as the church goes to our mission field, there's work to be done. Nothing's more important, nothing's more powerful than sharing your story of the difference that God has made in your life. I'm not talking about preaching at people or beating them over the head with a big black Bible. Just telling people that God's made a difference in my life. I was so messed up. Man, I may have looked okay on the outside, but inside there were fears, there was confusion, and Jesus Christ set me free. Just tell them that. And there's a sense of urgency. Don't put it off. It's not someday. Today is the day of salvation. That's what Jesus said. The New Testament makes it clear. We have this moment. This hour is ours. I'm so thankful for a church like Waterline. I'm so thankful for Pastor John and Danielle and their passion, their sense of urgency that, that moved them out of the comfort zone to do stuff that had never been done before. I'm so grateful for a team of people who work together and for all of you who are part of Waterline. Did you know there's literally thousands of people around us who don't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ? You say, Mark, don't you know there's like churches on every corner? No, nah, I see that. But people aren't attracted to buildings. People are attracted to people who have experienced the love of Christ. They did a survey recently in the state of Indiana. I mean, you think 
Everybody in Indiana must be connected to some kind of church or religious organization. And they found out that in our state, three million people self-identified. Over three million said, I have no religious affiliation at all. And you know some of those people. You work with them. You live next door to them. Maybe you're related to them. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray. And if, if you took this little card, this little uh, note-taking guide, the, the back of this is blank. But as we've been talking about people in our lives who need Christ, it may, all, it may be that, that already you began to think about somebody. They've been on your heart for a while or even just now. There's someone someone that God has uniquely placed in your path. You've intersected their life and you understand that if you don't reach them, maybe nobody else ever will. As we pray, you think about a name or two, maybe you'll even just write it down to just say, God, between you and me, here's here's the people that I believe you put on my heart. I want to make a difference in their life. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for Waterline Church. It's a church that really gets it, that's trying to make a difference. And thank you, Lord, for hundreds of people who've been impacted by the good news of Jesus Christ through this church, these people right here. And yet our work is far from done. You want them all. You want every single man, woman, boy, and girl to know that Jesus Christ loves them. And so as we think even now about people in our circle of influence, Pray, Lord, as they come to our mind that maybe like Bob Powers will knock on their door or maybe like Charlene Nimick, the school teacher, she'll just tell the other school teacher in the lounge about the difference that God's made in her life. Because we know this, there are people that we love and there are people that you love who may be one breath away from eternity. And we want our lives to count. We want to make a difference. We want this to be our life work. Maybe it's the only reason we're still alive is that there's somebody we know who needs to know Jesus. Send us from this place, God, with your love and your grace. In Jesus, let's sing together. When my heart is open.